Good morning. I'll try that again. Good morning. Glad to see you today. Um, if you're visiting with us, we're especially grateful for you being here. Hopefully you got a visitor's card when you walked in and we encourage you to fill that out. Just uh, hand it to somebody around you or just leave it where you are and we'll get them later. But we're glad that you're here. Uh, this is a wonderful family to be a part of, and uh, I hope that you get that sense today as well. But mostly, we're a, a, a neat family, but we have an awesome Father, and uh, He promises to be here today and work in our lives, and so I'm glad that we're here to be able to listen to Him and to be challenged by Him. Let me give you a few words of announcement. Uh, first of all, just a, a couple of introductions here. Uh, for, uh, Nathan and Bethany, uh, my son and daughter-in-law, had a baby girl last week. Name is Emmeline. So she was eight pounds, nine ounces, real small girl. Uh, compared to uh, Amy and, and uh, uh, Kyle Eccles, it, she was small, but she is healthy and doing well. So when you see them, uh, congratulate them. And we also have a, a new daughter here as well. Where are uh, Shannon and Nikki Mowry? And where is Shakira? There she is walking in right on time. Shakira has now officially, uh, Nikki, stand up. I don't know where your husband is. He was greeting people when they were walking in. Come here, Shannon. They are now the parents of Shakira. They officially adopted her on Wednesday. So, Good job, Daddy. But uh, anyway, we're excited about that and uh, just wanted to introduce that just really quickly as well. Don't forget VBS June 27th through July 1st. Uh, Pepper, where are you, Pepper? Pepper, stand up. You need to see Pepper. We need workers for VBS. We need to get all that sign up going. Uh, it'll be here sooner than you think, so make sure that you see Pe Pepper and let her know that you would be willing to work in VBS. And also in your bulletin there, we do have bulletins that we're handing out, not handing out, you can grab when you come in, uh, but there is a list on there of the project Thank You. This is for the Chattanooga Police Department. We put gift bags together for them uh, each year. Uh, there are items in there that we are collecting, uh, but also you can get gift cards or you can go straight to Amazon and they'll deliver it for you. So you can, there's actually a registry at Amazon that uh, you can do that. Uh, uh, Bailey will be sending an email out this week explaining how you can do that, but we need to start collecting for that. Let's have a word of prayer and uh, then our praise team will begin us in our time of worship. Father God, thank you again for today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And God, part of that rejoicing is worshiping you. And we get to sing to you now. And I pray, God, that uh, we sing in such a way that it brings you pleasure. And Lord, we don't have to sound good to bring you pleasure. It comes from our heart. And so, Lord, I pray that we would sing from our heart and we would give you all the praise and all the glory that is due your name because you are God and you deserve it. And so, Father, I pray that we're not here just for us today to get something from you, although you will do something. But, God, I pray that we would give to you, that we would serve you during this time with our, with our heart and with our very lives. So, God, we welcome you, and, uh, Lord, we are pleased to be in your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and lift up our voices and sing to our great God. His love endures forever.
so much stronger the king of glory the king of
Beside you, open up my 
God, we thank you that you are that firm foundation. There's nothing in this life that we can experience that's apart from you and apart from your control. God, you are with us at every step of the way, whether it's through the joys, the highs of happiness or the depths of despair, you are there. You are with us, strong, mighty, powerful God. You have called us to be your children. You have called us to live in a way that is dictated by you, to love the world like you did, to give yourself as a sacrifice for others. God, work in us now. Move in us now. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Uh, we're going to introduce a new hymn, or a newer hymn. But before I do that, I'm going to read from Psalm 139. This is verses 1 through 10. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too loft, lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast.
in the palm of your hand. You will not let go of us. We are secure because you love us so much. Lord, we take hold of that promise. We take hold of that insight that you hold us. You have us in the palm of your hands and you will not let go. Lord, we can face life because you will hold us fast. Lord, we pray for this time as we come to hear your message you give given to your servant. We pray that you would open up our ears, open up our hearts, that we might hear what you want to say to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin by asking you a question, and the question is this. How do you measure greatness? How do you measure greatness? Now, if you were in the NFL, it's Super Bowl rings. The more Super Bowl rings you have, the greater you are. That's why Tom Brady is considered the GOAT, the greatest of all time, because he has more rings than anybody else. In fact, I think he has more rings than all... uh, teams have even. I think he's got, what, seven now? But anyway, that's why he's considered the greatest of all time. In business, greatness is measured by how far up the ladder you go. The higher you rise, the greater you are. For others, greatness is based on how much money you bring in or the achievements that you accomplish in your life. But most of all, our definition of greatness is usually based on the word success. If we're successful, then that means that there is a greatness in our life, and most of us, if not all of us, desire to be great. What if I told you, though, that our definition of what it means to be great is all wrong? What if I told you that God defines greatness in a completely different manner? In fact, God's idea of greatness is is completely different from ours. To Him, Greatness is defined by who has the best servant's heart. And so we're going to look at the third quality of a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the third quality of this is this. A disciple 
has the heart of a servant. A disciple has the heart of a servant. I think we would all agree that Jesus Christ is the greatest of all time, the greatest one who's ever lived. So let's see why he came. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Now, kind of keep your finger in Matthew 20, because we're going to go to other passage, and then we're going to come back. But we're going to really start at the end of the story. Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus is speaking, and he says there, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He tells us three things there of why he came. First of all, he said, I didn't come to be served. Now, think about it. He is God in the flesh. He is the one who is above all, and he is the only one who deserves praise and worship and really our lives and our service. He's the one who it should go to. He is God, and he is the greatest. But he said, I did not come to earth for you to serve me. Instead, he said, I came to serve you. The creator put on flesh and came to serve what he had created. The one who is above it all got down to the lowest point and even washed feet. In John chapter 13, that's exactly what he did with his disciples. He did the task that was the most menial task of all. And he got down on his hands and knees and he washed his disciples' feet. It's what he did. It's who he was. But his servant service did not just end with washing of feet. In fact, that was just the beginning. Because he also said he came to give his life as a ransom for many. The word ransom in the Greek is an interesting word, and it is commonly used as the price paid to redeem a slave. Did you realize that's what Jesus Christ did for us? We were on the slave block. We were a slave to our sin. We were a slave to this world. We could not escape it. We could not get out of it. We were a slave to sin. So Christ came, God himself put on flesh, came and lived among us, and paid the penalty for our sin. That's why he died on the cross. He didn't die for himself. He didn't die because somebody put him up there. He died because he chose to do it to redeem us from the slave blocks. He willingly gave his life in service to you and I. Now turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 gives us some more insight into his service. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, I'll read through verse 11. Again, kind of keep your finger there in Matthew 20 because we're going to go back there. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In other words, this is what he did. He is our example. We need to do it as well. Who, being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being found in human likeness and the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul writing here, and he says that Jesus is in very nature God. The word nature there means the essential form of. In other words, when we have Jesus, we have the sum of all of the qualities that make God God. And it says that he came to give up that position, put on flesh, became one of us, yet he did not use his position as God to get what he wanted. Rather, it says that he made himself nothing. He became the least of the least, the lowest of the low, the poorest of the poor. And he, God himself, it says, took on the nature of man. Just like nature meant that he is fully God, it means that he is fully man as well. And he put on flesh and he became a servant. Now this is what hit me. He willingly put man, the creation, above himself. And folks, to me, 
This is more than anything else what separates Christianity from every other religion. Every other religion, their God is in heaven, he sits in heaven, he stays there, and he just kind of runs everything the way that he wants to. We have a God who loved us so much that he put on flesh, dwelt among us, and even made himself the lowest of the low, low to serve us. What an incredible God we serve. Such love, such giving. A God who chooses to serve us and then chooses us as well. Amen? What an incredible God. And not only that, it says he humbled himself and he became obedient. How obedient? To even death on the cross. You see, he was willing as God to be misunderstood, to be mocked, to be despised, to be tortured, and to be killed. Why? to serve you and I. Therefore, it says, God the Father exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, and one day every knee shall bow and every tongue acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So let me give you kind of a principle that I see here. The principle is this. If you walk in humility like Christ and serve, God will exalt you. But if you walk in pride and walk in selfishness, God will humble you. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, listen to what he says. In the same way, you who are younger, submit or serve yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. In other words, when we get up in the morning and we get dressed, we are to dress ourselves with humility as well. And that means that we think of others before we think of ourselves. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up, in due time. Again, Paul is telling us that when we walk in humility, when we exalt others, when we put others above ourselves, he says God will lift us up in due time in his way, but there will be an exaltation that takes place. Exactly what happened with Christ. So basically, he's letting us know here, if you want God against you, then walk in your pride. Walk in your arrogance. Make sure that all of life is all about you, and you can rest assured God is not going to be for you. But if you walk in humility and you live in such a way that you're serving and giving to others, God will exalt you. It is through our service that we are lifted up by God. So catch what is saying here. Jesus has the greatest name of all and is over all. Why? Because he served others. Therefore, he has changed the very definition of greatness, because greatness now means one who serves others the most. The greatest become like God and serve other people. Now, let's be honest. We don't live that way, do we? We, we kind of hope to sometimes, and we try to sometimes, but we really don't have this down, and I don't think we get it. But we're in good company because neither did his disciples. Because they strove for power, they strove for prestige and for position, just like we do. I think they had the exact same definition of greatness that we do. Now turn back to Matthew chapter 20. Let me read verses 20 through 24 of why Jesus said what he did. We'll get the context to it now. Matthew 20, starting in verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons. Somebody tell me, who are the sons of Zebedee? Come on, people. Who are the sons of Zebedee? James and John. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start going through biblical text again. If you don't know that, okay? James and John, two of the disciples, they're the sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of thunder. It said they came, he, she came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of, them, of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. 
And he replied, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Now, they really didn't understand what he was saying. The cup that he was talking about was him giving his life. Are you going to be able to do that? And basically, that's not what they really heard there. But yeah, we can drink the same cup. And Jesus, realizing that they eventually would give their life for him, he says this, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the turret ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Now, James and John and their mama go to Jesus, and basically what they want is they want the position of authority. They want to be on his right, and they want to be on his left. They want to be above everyone else except Jesus. They wanted others bowing down before them. And I think the reason the ten became indignant and they became angry was because James and John beat them to the punch. They wanted that as well. And I have a feeling they probably just started arguing with one another. That's not the first time they argued about that. In Luke chapter 22, verse 24, it says that a dispute rose among the disciples as to who was the greatest of them. It's almost like you can picture a group of kids fighting over who's the best, and that's exactly what the disciples were doing. Well, I'm greater than you. No, you're not. I did this and this and this. I'm greater than you are. And it kept going back and forth. They had the world's concept of greatness embedded within them just like we do. So Jesus has to redefine the word greatness, and he does that in verse 25 through 27. Jesus called them together and said, Hey guys, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Folks, this is a totally different concept of greatness. God's concept and the world's concept of greatness are on polar opposites. Jesus said, someone is, who is great does not lord it over other people. They don't live to exalt themselves or strive to rise in the ranks so that they're above everybody else and they have all of the power and all of the prestige and all of the position. They don't strive to be at the top of the pecking order. Instead, what they do, the greatest in God's eyes, are the ones who serve the most. The greatest willingly put others before themselves. The greatest are those who serve. The greatest are those who choose to be last, not first. So Jesus redefines greatness with his very words, but he redefines it with the way that he lived as well in his actions. So young people and adults alike who are here, do you really want to be great? Then choose to serve others. To be great means that you put somebody else in front of yourself. I pray that we would be a church full of a bunch of great people, not because we are so powerful or have all these positions, but because we are willing to get out there and serve the least of these around us. A few years ago, one of the books that I'm using to study on, on discipleship, the pastor there went to speak at a very large church in Florida. When he arrived, it was raining, and it, because it was uh, such a big parking lot, they had golf carts that went and picked up people, and then they drove them to the church. Well, a golf cart pulled up, and loaded within that was a man that was driving that was drenched from the rain, and he noticed that the man looked very familiar. Come to find out, the driver of their golf cart was a guy named Mike Huckabee, who is the former governor of Arkansas, and at this time was a candidate for the presidency of the United States. When they began to talk, Dennis asked Huckabee why he was picking people up in a church parking lot in a golf cart, to which he responded, Dennis, I follow Jesus Christ. Jesus was always a humble servant, so if I follow him, I want to serve too. And they continued talking, and Dennis asked him about his candidacy, and Huckabee explained it this way. He said, Dennis, if I'm serious about being the leader of this nation, I need to be a chief servant. 
Now, we don't hear that much anymore. That's the kind of man that I would want as my president, a man that's not full of himself, but full of humility and service, someone who is like Christ and not an arrogant man. And in God's eyes, I think that defines greatness. But few of us are like this. Instead, we tend to be very self-absorbed people. We do for the benefit of ourselves more than anyone else. We live life, and we want everybody else to serve and to minister to us. In reality, if we were really honest about it, the way that we're living right now in our self-absorbed society, we'd be honest and say it ain't working. Because the statistics show us that People in our society right now are more depressed and have a greater sense of loneliness than ever before in history. It ain't working. You know what would work? We get fulfilled when we begin to serve other people. So here's my challenge before you as a way of application. Again, I want you to write these down, fill in the notes as you go through. Four areas that we need to serve in. Number one. First and foremost, we need to live life in service to God. We need to serve God. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says this, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? This is it. To fear the Lord or respect the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. You know, we have a God, as we said a while ago, it's different from every other God that people worship. In fact, He really is the only God. But He has given so much for us and to us. Why don't we give back to Him? The only time we serve God shouldn't just be on Sunday morning at 10 or 11 o'clock. We are to serve Him every day of our lives. And how do we do that? How do we serve God? Well, He tells us here. He said we serve Him by obeying Him, by listening to His commands and doing what He asks us to do. We serve Him by worshiping Him, singing our praises to Him, but also living in such a way that my life is bringing glory and honor to Him. And we saw a couple of weeks ago, one of the best ways to serve God is by serving the least. Jesus said, when you serve the least, you're serving me. There's so many ways that we can serve God. Are you? Are you serving God? Secondly, we need to serve our family. We need to serve our family. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul gives instruction for Christian households, how things ought to work. And he begins with this verse, 521. He said, submit or serve one another out of reverence for Christ. Did you realize that part of the family structure that we have right now is for us to serve one another? It's to learn how to serve. He puts us in family so that we can learn how to serve one another. Moms and dads, are you serving your kids? And I'm not just talking about do you work really hard so that you can give your kids everything they want. That may be a part of it, but you know what they need more than what you give to them? They need you. They need your time. They need you listening to them. They need quality as well as a quantity of time. Folks, we need to pour into our children more than we pour into our work. And most of, our, of us guys, we really care more about our work than we do our kids because we spend so much more time doing it, trying to be successful in our jobs and our work than we do it as a husband or as a father. Folks, we need to pour into our kids. Moms and dads, your job as a parent is to bring your child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That means that it is your job to make sure that they are becoming just like Jesus Christ. Your job is to disciple them. Pour into your kids. But children, listen to me. You're not in that family just so your parents can serve you. Amen, mom and dads? Kids, you are to serve your parents. Are you? Most kids that I see, and I was this way growing up as well, most kids are self-absorbed. The whole world revolves around them. 
Let me tell you something. The world does not revolve around you. And you are called to serve your parents. So let me tell you how you can do that. Instead of waiting until they nag you to death to do something, do it before they start nagging. Listen to me, moms and dads really don't like to nag. They almost feel like they have to to get you to, uh, to do something. So go and do the dishes without them asking. Mow the yard. Do your homework without them having to push you to do it. And something else, learn to say thank you. You can serve your parents by simply telling them, you know, thank you for all that you do. And something else that you can begin to say to one another without having to be coaxed to do it, go up to your mom and dad one time, you'll just floor them and say, I love you. You see, we are put in families to serve one another, but it seems like that's who we serve the least. Husbands, are you serving your wives? Wives, are you serving your husbands? If you try to outserve one another, I guarantee you it will make your marriage better. We're called to serve one another. Thirdly, we should serve our community. We should serve our community. God has you in the neighborhood that he does for a reason, to get to know your neighbors, to see their needs, and to begin to meet them. And I am really being challenged that we need to start doing more of that as a church. Did you realize that through our association, there's a lot of different ways that we can serve our community? For instance, we have what is called uh, Hakoba which is basically a feeding ministry. We have a, a church in East Ridge, and we pull our sources together, and they uh, buy food and hand it to those who need food. We should be a more of a part of that as a church, not only just giving money to Hakoba, but also having people that donate their time to go and hand out that food and to minister to people. It's not just about handing out food. It's about touching people's lives for Jesus Christ. We also have a ministry through the association called the Women's Job Corps. Uh, we have a group of women who come alongside of other women who need help, who need jobs, who need education, and give them what they need to be successful in this world. They meet the needs of other women. If you're called to meet the needs of other women, ladies, get involved in that. There are so many ways that we can serve. There are so many things that we can do. We've got a lot of people in our church that know how to work on cars and change oil. Why don't we have a day where we just tell the neighborhood, you bring your oil and your filter and we'll change your oil for you. We'll do minor repairs on your car. We need to start serving our community in whatever way that we can. For instance, even just recently, the Patton Towers, about a month or two ago, there was a fire there. A lot of those people are not living there right now. And so one of the churches came alongside of them and you know what they're doing? They're washing their clothes. Why can't we do that? There are so many ways that we can serve our community with the love and through the name of Jesus Christ. Serve your community. And lastly, serve your church. Serve in your church. Did you realize that God gives every one of us who are saved a spiritual gift? And many of those gifts are used so that you can serve those within the body of Christ. And we are to use those gifts to come alongside of each other, to encourage one another, to instill courage with one another, and just to serve one another. God did not put this church here for us to attend on Sunday morning to sit here for an hour and go home and not see each other until the next Sunday. We are to get involved in each other's lives, and we are called to serve one another. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Paul writes, and he says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why? to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The body of Christ is built up when we're all using our spiritual giftedness to pour into each other's lives and to serve one another. So let me ask you, from, from those who are children, teenagers, to those that are senior adults, 
How are you serving in your church? What are you doing to impact the lives of others? What gift do you have that you are coming alongside of others and giving into their lives and serving them? Folks, a disciple serves other people. That's what real greatness is. Let's pray. Father, I really do believe that we have the wrong definition of greatness. We live in a day and a time, and really this is just human nature from the beginning. We just are so self-absorbed. We live in such a way that we want everybody else doing for us. But Jesus, I thank you that you came here and you didn't come to be served, but you came to serve us. And even to give your life on a cruel, old, rugged cross, you died to serve us, to ransom us, to set us free. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here today who has never accepted what you've done for them, that today would be the day that they say, Jesus, I realize today you died for me. You paid the penalty and price for my sin. I cannot get rid of it. You can. And so I receive what you've done for me right now, and I give you my heart and my life. And I pray that you would give your heart and life to him today. He came to give his life as a ransom for you. He came to serve you. Therefore, we should serve one another. If we want to be like Christ, if we want to be great like He is, we're called to serve. So let me ask you, what can you do this week to serve someone else? I want you to think about that. And even if something comes to your mind, I want you to write it down on the note page. God is putting something on your heart and mind right now already. This is how I want you to serve, and this is who I want you to serve. Lord, being a disciple is not easy. But Lord, I pray that we would be great disciples of yours. That we would become more like you by serving each other. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to have our invitation. This is a time to invite you to make decisions for Christ, to come and to kneel and to pray whatever you need to do. The altar is open for you. So would you come as we stand together and sing?
Y'all be seated. Now, see, Roy got onto me last week because it was too short, so I was letting it go on today, and then he cuts it off. So, I need one for Glenda too. We have a couple that uh, we have a couple that are going to come and and join today. Uh, one with a brand new last name and got a new grandma as well. But uh, uh, I'm going to ask first of all Shakira if you would come. This is now Shakira Maori, and uh, she was waiting until she became a part of their family, but she wants to become a part of our family as well. She has already accepted Christ and been baptized, but she wants to come and serve here and allow y'all to, to serve her as well. If you would agree with Shakira Maori, isn't that a good sound to it? Shakira Maori into the life of our church, would you say amen? Amen. Glenda, amen. come on up. Shakira, you can stay up here. Come stand next to Grandma. This is her new grandma. This is Glenda Mowry. This is Shannon's mom. And uh, she's been visiting us for about uh, 25 years now. No, just kidding. <laughs> she's been uh, visiting with us for about three years now. And she's been a part of us for those three years without having to come and join. But she is making it official now. She is becoming official part of our family, wants to be here. She has accepted Christ, been baptized as well. Uh, she wants to be a part of our family as well, and she is a wonderful lady, beautiful spirit, and has a servant's heart as well. So if you would agree with Glenda Mowry coming to be a part of our church, would you say amen as well? Amen. amen. Yeah, stay up here. Stay here. Y'all will want to come by and just uh, give them a fist bump when they, when, they, uh, when they join. Usually we give them hugs. We can't do that right now, but make sure that you come by. Greet them into the life of our church and uh, just let them know that you love them. Let's stand together as we close this morning. Grady, if you would, would you lead us in our benediction prayer? Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for allowing each and every one of us to be a part of your family how you have adopted each one of us. You grafted us into your, your family. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for the increase of our local family here at Oakwood. We pray that you continue to bless everything that we do because we want to glorify your name, not because of uh, we want you to bless us. We want your name to be glorified. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue to use us in any way that we can. Lord, help us to serve, help us to love, help us to do what you've called us to do. And I pray that as we go out these doors, in Jesus' name.